I'm Lauren Circu. I'm the co-founder of Sorensen Impact Advisory, which is um, a wealth management firm that is 100% dedicated to impact investing. So impact measurement is a core part of what we report on to clients. Um, and I'm thrilled to share the stage with four incredible panelists. Um, I've got with me here Sasha Dichter, who is the um, co-founder and CEO of impact measurement firm 60 Decibels. Um, Dipti Pratt, who is the managing director of global membership and head of Americas for Tonic. Um, Anthony Bug Levine, who is the managing director and co head of community impact at Lafayette Square. And then Astrid Scholes, who is the co founder of Armayaria. <laughs> Did I say that right? Close. Close. <laughs> Close enough. Well, what I'd love to do, we've got a lot to get through in a short amount of time. So why not let's keep our introductions quite brief. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and share a brief overview of how your organization approaches impact measurement. And maybe Sasha, we'll start with you and go down the line. Sure, um, thank you very much. Welcome to SOCAP, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I've, uh, the company I run, 60 Decibels, is trying to fill what we see as a massive data gap in the impact measurement space. We feel the company is called 60 decibels. It's the volume of the human conversation. And we want scalable, comparative metrics that are based on what human beings are actually experienced to be the everyday currency of how we do our work. And so we founded the company because we didn't see that that was happening and that that data was available. And so we make that available to our clients um, all over the world. Can you hear me? Yeah, now you can, okay. I'm Dipti Pratt. Um, I've been at part of Tonic for about four years now. I have a long background in impact. Um, and we approach, Tonic is a global community of impact investors, so essentially family offices, foundations, individuals, and we're showing up for them in a variety of ways because they're at a very variety, variety of points in their impact journey. And so for some, it's how do you think about it? What does it even look like? What are the right metrics and how do you define it? And to others, it's about further alignment as to where they are. Um, hi everyone, Anthony Bug Levine. And before we talk about how we measure impact, I just want to talk about why we do. Um, I held myself very accountable to two women in my life. The one is my grandmother, Lydia Levine. Um, and I knew, she was a Holocaust survivor, and I knew, before I can remember when I learned, I knew what happens to societies when we stop treating people as people. And we all have examples from our own histories of what that is, and we're living it right now. And I do this work, and I held myself very accountable that what we're doing is gonna make a difference. And the other person I hold myself accountable is my six-year-old daughter, who literally said to me last night, why are you going there? <laughs> and I feel like, you know, impact investing to me is about this, we, we're claiming we are here not just to pursue money-making careers, but also to make a difference. And I feel like that's to me, it's not, you know, how do you report or it's those abstractions. It just comes down to, we're all in some way doing this work because we want to make a difference in people's lives. And that's why you know, we're, do, we're doing what we're doing on the measurement side. We get into the specifics. Lafayette Square, where I work, um, sort of two roles. We have a for-profit asset management company. I think we are trying to answer the call that the Global Impact Investing Network made a few years ago, where they said the impact investing industry requires us to scale with integrity. To scale means you have to be able to mobilize institutional assets managed by pension funds. Uh, and to do it with integrity is, I think, what this conversation is about. And I also represent our affiliated nonprofit, where sitting down alongside government and saying, how can we help bring private sector capital to contribute to the national interest that government is defining? You cannot do any of that unless you have a really credible way of measuring, managing impact, and differentiating ourselves from the investors who are there for very different reasons. And I'm Astrid Schultz. I'm a recovering nonprofit executive turned tech entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And my company, Almalaria, named after the largest living organism on Earth, look it up, it's a fungal ecosystem. It's programmatic, the name. It's invisible infrastructure. And that's why we exist. We're building digital infrastructure to mobilize people and innovations and capital to actually address and achieve the sustainable development goals. And when I was in the nonprofit world and we were creating innovative impact finance vehicles to, for example, uh, turn industrial forests into ecologically managed forests. For every impact investor, there was a different impact measurement system. Yeah. Sound familiar to any entrepreneurs in the room? Mm -hmm. So with my company, what we're trying to solve and would like to be able to solve is uh, an easier way to count impact 
Um, and at last count, I think last time we tried this about five years ago with the Bertelsmann Foundation, there were 150 different impact investing platforms. They all use different measurement frameworks. So I'm here to fire some of those shots. <laughs> That's got to change. We need, and you can tell from my accent, I'm German, so I'm looking for more efficiency <laughs> in impact measurement. <laughs> That's great. Thank you all for, for sharing with us. Um, and maybe Astrid, we'll stick with you and then we'll come back down the line. I want to just take a minute to set the stage and get a state of the union on the impact measurement industry. And I'd love to do kind of a two-part question. The first is, what are the biggest challenges that you're tackling today around impact measurement? And then the flip side, any breakthroughs that you've seen either you know, kind of at, at the industry level or that you feel your firm and team has had recently? Yeah, I'm not going to answer that from my firm's perspective. I think um, I already indicated in my introduction the biggest challenge I see is the lack of standardization yeah. around impact measurement. And we're in North America, we're particularly culpable here that we've had this sort of let a gazillion impact measurement systems bloom, where in my you know, home territory of the European Union, there's a more of a regulatory approach to right. saying, yeah. this is how we shall measure the things that matter. And um, I don't think that incredible differentiation and, and innovation and abundance is serving the sector well, especially from the entrepreneur's perspective. If you are in the business of having to then do impact measurement as part of your business operations, I think that really gets in the way in businesses that are already cash starved and have a longer time to product market fit and all those things. The, the flip side of this is the, some of the opportunities I see. I think the biggest one might be that um, because of technology and these supercomputers that we're all holding in our hands, it is now possible to collect impact measurement at the quote unquote beneficiary level. I don't like that terminology, but we can actually get real time information from the people who are being served with various interventions. And I think that's very exciting um, that that exists now and we, it's not nearly ubiquitous enough, but mm. that's one of the rays of hope I see. Mm. Very helpful. Anthony, what would you add in uh, terms of both challenges and any breakthroughs that you've yeah. seen? Yeah, so you know, Again, I think part of my commitment to my grandmother, my daughter, is not to waste time on bullshit. So let, let's, let's be real. I think the biggest challenge in impact investing, and not just of impact measurement, but yeah. to the realization, the aspiration we have in this room, that impact investing will be a generational force for progress in our society. I think that's what we're all committed to on some level. To me, we are in a moment of balance. That could happen, it could not happen. I think the biggest challenge, yeah. which is related to this conversation, is the lack of discernment among asset owners and the people who manage their money. And you guys are different. You're trying to build something really different. Your, your members represent, I think, you know, the, some of the more discerning, and you know, certainly we, you, know, you, you work with them. But yeah. when I look at it overall and what we're encountering as a firm, I think if we look back in 10 years and say we actually didn't do what we could have done, you know, impact investing was never supposed to be measured by the number of dollars moved. It was supposed to be measured, at least as I understood it, our success was going to be measured in the lives we impacted and for the people on the planet. Um, I think the biggest challenge is if the owners of capital and the people who represent their money and make investment decisions are not discerning on impact. Yeah. From a purely market Darwinian perspective, the firms that take impact management seriously will be investing in a set of costs that will not be rewarded by the market, and a Darwinian process will weed us out and what will be left will be the mainstream firms that are slapping impact on and doing it in the lowest cost way. And I don't say that out of any bitterness. I think that is a completely predictable reaction to the way yeah. our systems are set up. So that's the challenge. I would love to hear from you about your members and what you're trying to build. Um, but I, do, I think that you can't expect the entrepreneurs in this room and the fund managers in this room to invest in a set of management principles or costs that are not rewarded by their discerning, by discerning investors. In terms of you know, what's interesting, I'd say what we're doing at Lafayette Square, which I'm super proud of, um, three things. We don't have an impact report. Um, if you want to know about our impact, read our SEC filings. This should not be an innovation. But when we did this last year, it suddenly I asked everyone, many of you in this room, you're looking at all these fund managers who claim to be having impact. Are any of them actually embedding their impact reporting? This sounds esoteric, but if we lie in our SEC filings, we are going to be fined, go out of business, or worse. If we write a glossy impact report, there's no accountability. So if you're serious about impact, 
put your impact reporting into where it's accountable. That's one thing we're doing. The second thing I, I really treasure is anyone out there who is producing impact reporting, and, and I talk about this, be an owl rather than a peacock. Hmm. So most impact reports are they're a peacock. It's let me tell you about how pretty I am. Uh, yeah. These are the great things we did. That can't advance the work because I can't learn anything from the nice pictures you have or the people you help and the stories you tell where the motivation for your work is to sort of present something nice for investors. So be an owl. Yeah. Write a report that's about what you learned. What was your hypothesis about how you could generate impact? What did you learn by both affirming and refuting that hypothesis in the work you did last year? What are you going to do differently because of those learnings? I will read any report that's structured around that. And I think, again, there are people out there who are doing that. Um, but I understand the pressure to be a peacock because when you're facing non-discerning LPs, that's what they want. Um, so you give them what you want because we're all trying to survive. The last thing I'll say, and I'll leave this to Sasha to really pick up, um, you know, you've got to be talking to the people whose lives you claim to be making a difference to, but I'll leave it to him to pick that one up. I love it. I love the owl, not a peacock. I think that's a really, really good um, metaphor. Yeah, I mean, just but in your work, you, you look at funds all the time. How helpful are the peacock reports? for you to make a judgment as an investor about how a fund manager is doing. The owls are much, much more helpful. But I will say, I do think clients and families also enjoy the storytelling component. I think, you know, whether it's on the grant making side or investing for impact, I think they're, I think, you know, perhaps a mix of the two. Maybe, maybe there's a bird in the middle that, <laughs> that, that I, I think is, you know, accomplishes both quantitative and qualitative. Dipti, what about you? Back to challenges and, and um, any breakthroughs or, or things you're proud of. Yeah, no, great question. So I think the first thing is, I mean, a lot of what's said, right? The complexity is so, so difficult and hard to overcome and also paralyzing because you don't want, yeah. how do you take that first step? So I think simplicity is incredibly important. Um, where we see additive is where is there comparative conversations, where are there conversations where you're sharing and exchanging and dialogue together and learning because that's where we're all pushing everything forward and we're questioning and understanding and coming from a place of curiosity. Um, and the other big issue is that, I mean, to that point about regulatory, right? Regulatory means you're gonna change the conversation. If this is one of many approaches and everyone has equally as many approaches, how do we learn and how do we go forward? Very uh, helpful. It's hard to go last because I want to <laughs> build on all these things. I'm like, wait, another idea. Uh, I really I, I love what everybody said. Um, I'll just try to build on, on that. Um, I think the to, to me, in addition to what has been said, within this context of measurement of impact, we have spent as a sector... 15 years convincing people who will pay attention that this is not a useful activity. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to actually meaningfully prove that engaging in this activity will create meaningful value, mm -hmm. which we have failed to do. So just think about it, like we have to make up so much ground to get to the starting line, yeah. because if you've been paying attention, it is deadweight loss in economic terms, it is a tax, it's just noise to make these reports that nobody really cares about. And if you're an entrepreneur, it's something you want to get done with so that you can get back to doing your work, mm -hmm. which is pretty paradoxical because most of these entrepreneurs are committing their lives to solving really hard problems. So the fact that that entrepreneur wants to get this activity over with mm -hmm. and go back to doing that thing means the thing they're trying to get over with isn't providing value to them, which is the core problem. So I think we have collectively have to have a branding problem, but a value creation problem first and foremost, which is create meaningful value through the activity of doing this measurement. I think then to build on the simplicity versus the complexity, you know, we, and I'll just speak now, our, our world at 60 decibels is really mostly confined to things that are social impact related for private capital, which I realize is a huge simplification of the whole world, but just that's all I can get my head around for now. We call the company 60 decibels because of the volume of a human conversation. To Anthony's point, I think there should be a Surgeon General's warning on any impact report at all, Peacock or otherwise, that was published without speaking to an actual human being. And you just say it in giant letters. We did all of this stuff, we didn't talk to one actual person. And I think 90% of the reports would have that warning label, and I think that would be a nice feedback mechanism um, to your discernment point. 
But again, where we've been building what we've been building is to say all of the, I, I, I don't even know all the frameworks. I should, I need to keep studying up on European regulation because I do think it's important. But all the stuff we've done before that, it's complex because it's outside in. Mm -hmm. And so where we have been trying to make progress is to say if you start by speaking to human beings, that will get you meaningful data. And let's solve that problem from there and the simplicity will come from that and then we can figure out how to feed in to other things. Um, but I do think to just the last point of Bill and Anthony's, the lack of discernment and curiosity and sophistication with which people who are deploying capital towards impact, the fact that that remains acceptable in our ecosystem is surprising and is problematic. But I think it's, that's, that's an outgrowth of we've had these terrible, terrible, terrible value creation and terrible feedback loops that allows that to, like you could never have this low level of discernment on your financial and business picking acumen and survive. Yeah. Truly. So, I mean, that's what's fascinating, is that we are this far into our lives as a sector, and it's okay to show up and be like, trivialize, really, what Anthony very succinctly described as our whole purpose. Yeah, very, very well said. I think it's a, a big challenge. And I'd love to turn, maybe we go a little bit deeper, deep, deep, I think I'll go to you. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit at, you know, at Tonic what your families and institutions are looking for um, as it relates to impact measurement. And how have you, I think, you know, everyone's talking about this first layer of challenges that we have in terms of putting together useful OWL-like reports. Um, we, we have yet another challenge, which is rolling all of those up across lots of different managers and direct companies for families and institutions. So talk, talk to us a little bit about that challenge, how it's evolved over time. Yeah, great question, okay. So at Tonic, because we're representing one, a wide type of individual, we're also representing different geographical approaches. 45% of our community is here in the Americas, 45% in EMEA, and 10% APAC. So that means people are focused with different challenges. But at the heart, it's what Anthony is saying. Why are we showing up and doing this work? Why do we get up every day? And so for how our members approach it is essentially we have a platform tool called Tonic Tracer. What it does is it aligns across SDGs to say what what are you measuring against? What is the metric that matters to you? And how do we help? And rather than saying this is unique to us, it's rather built on Iris Plus and built on other things to allow for us to take that comparability of what's already going on in the market and ecosystem. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is because people are at different levels for some, it's understanding what impact measurement's gonna look like. They're still defining what is that metric, what is that thesis, or what are they gonna approach? So helping them to understand that. We have a educational experience that allows for folks to come in and learn and think about, how do you think about cash as an asset class, and how are you gonna deploy that in a meaningful way to meet your impact thesis? What are the types of assets that you're actually looking to deploy into? And also, when you're thinking about, for example, catalytic capital, how are you thinking about that? What is that? That's a very finite pool. What are you actually looking to so that you can achieve the impact measurement goals that you're seeing. How we've seen the evolution and what that's looked like has been moving more from just focusing on what those metrics look like to focusing on what Anthony is sharing. What is that approach around what are the impacts? What does that actually look and feel like for that entrepreneur or for that actual experience that the people on the ground actually need? Very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, Anthony, maybe I'll go to you next, and I'd love to hear, you know, a little bit about how Lafayette Square has has evolved in terms of impact measurement. Um, what, where, where did you start? Where are you today? Where do you hope to be? Yeah. So I think um, one thing I would say for the lawyers, I can't answer the detail I'd like to, just because of how we're <laughs> registered with the SEC. But um, you know, again, I think you know Lafayette Square, founded in 2020, successful Wall Street entrepreneur says, I don't want to raid the fourth fund, which I could have done with my old prior credit business. I want to do something in impact, but with a specific lens around scalability. And again, this is not mm -hmm. better or worse. It's just a part of the field we play in. I think there's a lot of other people who've got to be doing a lot of other things. But we are specifically trying to answer that question of how do you scale with integrity, which I said, you have to be able to mobilize money from pension funds, from insurance companies, um, and from big institutional investors. Mm -hmm. That's the scale part. And then the integrity part, I think, is a challenge that, that we've had. And uh, but not a challenge. I think it's an opportunity. I think, you know what? So for us, it's um, you know, at a very high level, and this is public. We we we're targeting like a lot of you guys are. There's a geographic target. We seek to place capital in underserved and overlooked people in places in the U.S. 
you can hold us accountable. It's in our SEC filings. At least half of our capital is going to go to low-income places or companies that primarily employ low-income people. Um, and then the second thing we do is we invest with companies owned by human beings, not by corporations. So we have a point of view that mm -hmm. companies that are owned by humans are more inclined to be invested in their workers in the way we want to. And then the real core of our impact thesis is around how do we help our borrowers improve the well-being, financial security, and economic mobility of their workers? So that's our sort of, so we have geographic targeting, and then a real point of view around, um, you know, how do you help the company meet them where they are, um, and then help them improve the, what that job quality is to the workers. And, I, you know, but the, along the way of that journey of how do you tell that story in, in a compelling way that brings in institutional assets, I think one thing we've encountered is um, something that I wasn't as sensitive to before, an unhelpful virtue signaling puritism among mm. some of the institutional investors, mm. the ones who have like an impact arm, yeah. and then they'll say, you know, so we get things like, well, we don't want our money to be invested in any company that doesn't pay a living wage. And if you go on the MIT living wage calculator, it's all done based on zip code, you can see what it is. Most companies in America that employ most people in America do not pay living wage, and doesn't meet that standard. And what the person in, in this firm said, well, look, we represent a massive, you know, institutional investor, we are the impact group, and we have a point of view that we don't want our money to be used on companies that aren't doing a good job, you know, that aren't already paying a living wage. And I think I get that. So there's where we operate, which is the middle markets, a mid-sized company in the U.S., there's 300,000 companies. They employ 50 million workers. It's the plurality of women, people of color, and poor people in the private sector workforce in America. That's who we target. Now, of those 300,000 companies, I bet not one-tenth of one percent pay all their workers a living wage. And those who do, have outsourced all the ugly stuff, right? Yeah. So they don't pay for cleaning and all that. Those guys aren't getting paid a living wage. So I get that you want your impact fund to be focused on helping people, but if you only invest in those companies that are paying a living wage, my question is what about the other you know, 49.99 million people? So the reason I'm bringing this up in an impact, you know, impact management conversation and measurement, it's this real question of are you measuring, what we're trying to say is we'll provide you with accountable data based in our SEC filings, including conversations with the people whose lives we claim to be improving, about how we're making those jobs better and those people more economically secure. Um, and we're going to meet them where they are. We're not necessarily going to say just because you're not already sort of, you know, high impact, you're not good enough for us. And, I, and again, it just goes back to a really simple question in my mind. If you go to the break room on the factory floor, our first investment was in a recycling waste management company in North Carolina called Zero Waste. If you go to the Zero Waste, which happened to actually be an employee ownership transition, so we were financing that. But if you go to the break room and you ask the people, would you rather we showed up and try to make, work with your company to make these jobs better quality or stay away because of our impact purity, what would you prefer? I mean, again, like, just to have that basic human approach to all this work. Um, so it's a bit of a non sequitur, but um, I'd say, you know, in general, we get away with too much with a lot of LPs. We can get away with the you tell nice stories and you guys show up different. Um, and then the ones who are super discerning are sometimes unhelpfully purists. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> Got to find the right balance. Um, Astrid, I'd love, love to go to you and take a kind of zoom over to Europe for a moment. And um, you mentioned, I think, a, a really staunch difference between the US environment and the European environment. The European one is very much a, a regulatory-based environment, as you noted. We have... Um, Article 8 and 9 SFDR regulations out that are guiding how funds are supposed to be doing, doing and reporting on impact measurement. Given your lived experience of kind of the regulatory regime, do you think that's the right approach? Do you think it's been helpful? Um, has, it, has it set out to achieve, you know, what it, what it, what, what it was designed to do? You're asking the woman who left Europe when she was 16. Um, yeah, I will say the, and I say this with my recovering economist hat on, you know, the thing about regulation is it really does create, it, it reduces uncertainty yeah. for everyone involved, right? Um, just you pick another, a, an example from a complete, you know, little adjacent to what we're talking about. When Europe regulated plastic such that um, manufacturers would have to take it back at the end of life, I think the n average number of polymers used in car production went from 23 to 2, <laughs> right? This, you make this a problem for BMW and Mercedes, they're going to figure out how to manage that supply chain real yeah. quick. Yeah. And is, are those cars any worse? Of course not. 
right? Would the would the car manufacturers have come up with this out of their own volition in some, you know, volunteer uh, industry coalition? Uh, no. Um, and so that's that's the benefit of regulation, right? And what's what's been so intriguing to me, I've I've, and I haven't studied it in any depth, but what's interesting about the regulatory regime around ESG reporting that's emerging in Europe is not only are they requiring uh, companies to adhere to a shared regulatory framework, which again reduces the number of variables and all that good stuff, they're proposing to certify the certifiers, right? So everybody running around with their own, you know, so in this world, uh, people who are, you know, selling Iris Plus type platforms to everybody and their cousin, they would be the ones that are also getting assessed and how they're doing their work. And that's really interesting. I think when we when we sort of increase sort of the accountability across the board, and then I'm hoping that an outcome on the entrepreneur side is that it becomes much m easier and much more accepted for the enterprises themselves to, to measure what matters to them, <laughs> pick that out of the regulatory bouquet, right? Measure what matters, and then report that out. You know, to your point, in SEC filings or just on their on their balance sheet, wherever wherever you want to make it visible, and share that with all their investors, as opposed to having to at the moment still customize, you know, for everybody's uh, impact framework. So those are just a, just some advantages that come up top of mind here. Very, very helpful. Um, and then, Sasha, maybe we'll, we'll come to you, and I'd like, I'd like to have you share your thoughts a little bit. There's been a lot of talk on social performance and benchmarking. Um, how, have, have you all kind of started to do this? What, what are your thoughts on kind of the approach and the practical implementation of it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I mean, we are huge believers in comparability of metrics. Like any metric at all, if it's a unique metric to you, I think is less worthwhile than another metric that you can compare with lots of other people. Um, you know, I, I, I think of this, um, therefore, you know, imagine a two by two, which is comparability high-low in one direction and materially important to the hypothetical person in the break room and the other axis. And to the extent to which there is a conversation around benchmarking comparability today, I think we're there might be high comparability, low usefulness is kind of where we are, mm -hmm. right? So all of, go, with my rant about how we've kind of built a not high value creating impact measurement system collectively up until this point, what that's left us to do is design metrics that again, you'd imagine like what is the best metric systems I could dev devise, but it really have the data that I wanted to, right? And so you're screening for the availability of data and you're screening for things like process measurements, which are all useful, but you're only, again, they're just a means to an end. Yeah. And so we have to keep on evolving and say, now that we have the ability to get the data we really want, which is, again, I'll just take the person at the break room hypothetically, just because that could represent anybody, right? Yeah. The thing from the actual person or the actual carbon emissions, if you're interested in that. If you had that actual data that is material important to that human being and then had comparability on that, then things are very, very useful. The how you go about doing that, I mean, we have been doing that at scale now in a number of sectors. So just to give a concrete example, um, <coughs> we just put out our second microfinance index report. It covers 114 microfinance institutions with a, so a representative sample of their clients on 20 different metrics about that matter to them. And those clients collectively, the 30,000 people we spoke to, represent about 60% of the 140 million microfinance customers globally, right? So to, you know, it's no longer a someday in the future we might be able to talk to people at scale and get comparable metrics of things. That, and the metrics are things like, are they in poverty or not? Gender empowerment metrics, could they respond to a financial shock? Are they missing meals or not? Is it hard to repay these loans? Like things that, again, if you just ask a person, who has one of these loans, as an example, what would matter to them, I'm highly confident that we would have a high overlap there. So it is all possible, but then we unfortunately have to go back to the beginning and go, okay, well all these metrics that we've built that didn't have that in mind right. are probably not doing particularly well on this criteria of how meaningful are they to the affected human being. Um, so we have to think of redesigning those systems. And again, unfortunately, if you're not a highly discerning consumer of all this stuff, you read things about benchmarks, performance measurement, you just have to like scratch the surface and be like, what are we comparing here and how useful, how material is it to that person? So I would say it's like a two-pronged thing. We are there and we've shown that we can do it at scale. 
Um, but we need to have it be on the right metrics, and we're still at the very beginning of that, ironically, even because we're decades into this work. Very well said. I think that tees us up well for maybe one final question to hopefully help summarize where we are for our audience. Um, what do you think the ideal end state is for impact measurement in reporting? And what is the gap that we need to close to get there? Um, and tough question, <laughs> a lot of meat on the bones. Um, Astrobigo. Not it. <laughs> <laughs> not it. I've, I've got one that's not about impact measurement per se, but it would it go, it go back a little up a level, which is yeah. the whole why of all of this, again, has been we are going to direct more. Some people who care about this are going to direct more capital to more things that make more impact. That's the end right. state, right? Yeah. So if our measurement system isn't being used in that way and isn't allow for that, then somehow we're fundamentally falling short. And it is not the case today that things that create more impact, like they might qualify for certain kinds of capital, yeah. but if you had 10 interventions or 100 interventions and the, the top five or 10% of them from a material, you know, material impact for the thing that you care about, when they show out and they're the best at that, it is n absolutely not easier for them to attract the next dollar today. And that's the sh that is the shift we need to make and that's why measurement matters. It doesn't matter in and of itself. But it matters because we're trying to make things that make more of a difference more likely to reach more people in a deeper way. And if, if those two things remain disconnected, then it, it still is mostly noise instead of signal. Yeah. Very helpful. Astrid, yeah, do you want to layer I, I, I will jump in and say um, I was so struck. I don't know if anybody's seen the sort of uh, interim report from the United Nations on how we're doing against the Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the things that really stuck out is that in many, for many of the however many hundreds of metrics they've identified as part of the overarching framework, um, in many, we just don't have the data. We don't even have, we're not even beginning to be able to collect data and we're halfway to 2030 um, since they were uh, adopted. And so I would, I'd like to see is, so that's a big massive yeah. gap, yeah. some of which happens at the country level, but in the, in the report there was really interesting commentary around how the private sector can help, and I would actually look to impact investing, the impact investing section of the private sector to sort of figure out how our measurement systems can ladder up to these international type comparisons um, and across different scales so that an individual entrepreneur who's measuring their impact in the community they're serving is vaguely, you know, or directly reporting on the same type of framework that ultimately led us up to the 17 goals. And that's where I can, I'm, I'm hoping for much more investment into the frameworks and standards um, that, that, and that is something we can drive from inside uh, the impact investing community. Makes sense. And Dip, did you wanna? I was gonna say, in? I think the one thing I would say about this is how do we get more people in the room? So if the measurement is bringing more individuals, how do we make it accessible and understandable? Then we know we're doing well because there are more of us and there's too many people for this one room. I think there's two things. Um, so again, if the point is we're trying to solve problems, we can only do that if we move more money to things that more effectively solve problems, which we can only do if investors become more discerning to, and start moving capital, as, as I said, to more solutions on the margin. I mean, this is how capitalism works when it does what it does well. It creates a lot of problems, but the basic allocation of the marginal dollar to the marginally more productive as defined activity is what this whole machine has been about. So I think there are two ways that have to happen. I mean, one is the kind of inside game you guys are playing, which is yeah. we have to create social pressure among asset owners that reading the nice stories isn't enough. I can't do that. I mean, there's a lot of data science that says I cannot, people's, that kind of practice is arrived at through socialization, not through analysis. It's not like someone read a detailed report and then read an anecdotal report and decided this is better. It's just, it's the norms we've, we've built. So. I think we need groups like Tonic, we need like, groups like you guys to socialize a different expectation. People should be as embarrassed as stewards of their family money if they're not being discerning on impact as some of them are right now if they're not being discerning around making sure that money perpetuates itself financially. So I think that's kind of an insider game. But at the end of the day, I'm just going back to regulation, we're going to do another session on this this afternoon. Uh, we do not get to scaling with integrity without this being regulated. And we have to, the people who are discerning on impact in this room have to run toward regulators, not away from them. We've got to reject our trade associations who push back against any reporting standards and say, no, actually, we need good reporting standards and we want to work with government to make that happen. I do not see, having done this for almost 20 years, 
that without people being compelled by regulators to do this, we're going to scale with integrity. We're going to get a lot of integrity, we're just not going to get the scale piece. So we have to work with our regulators. At the end of the day, we cannot, impact investing cannot reach its potential if the only capital being made available toward impactful things come from people who care about impact. We have to create the conditions in which people who do not care about impact find themselves compelled by their own motivations to put their money into this. This might be a controversial point of view, but it's where I stand. Without regulation, that won't happen. Once regulation's in place, it'll all flow from that. So I, you know, we are gonna do a session later today on, we actually have a representative of the US government here to talk about how do you show up and have that conversation. We gotta build a lot of bridges between this crowd and the government crowd.